Good morning, my YouTube friends and FB friends. Today is the second day of February 2017, and it is 10.23 a.m., and I intend to complete this lecture in less than 30 minutes. This is the first lecture on homiletics, or the art and science of preparing a sermon. Homiletics is the art of preaching or writing sermon. It is from a Greek word, homolia, which means to converse with, consort, which comes out as a word as homolitikos in Greek, then was adopted in the Latin, and later in the mid 17th century became homiletic from the English word of homily. There is always a perfect way to do things in anything we do in this world and in the world of angels. One of them is how to present God's message to his people. Therefore, it is imperative to search and discover this best possible way of dissemination of God's message to his saints. It is most important to figure out once and for all to master this art and science of presenting God's message. I would do injustice if we won't look into the various ways of preachers have in past adopted certain ways and methods of presenting the good news of Christ. I will mention them, but I won't go into the detail because I don't believe in them. There are methods of preaching, but expository sermons are the best way or method of preaching. And it is the only perfect way of preaching. Expository sermons. However, there are many preachers who claim to be expository preachers but they fall short. So it is important to know what is an expository sermon. Ex expository sermons. The preacher who employs this method of sermon is concentrating on giving details of the passage or paragraph from a chapter of a book in the Bible. He explains away the real intent of what the Bible is really trying to convey to its listeners. This technique, which is both an art and science, is called exegesis of the passage, or chapter of the book in the Bible. Exegesis is a technical and grammatical exposing or exposition of the passage. In other words, it is careful drawing out of the exact meaning of a passage in its original context, and thus it is the primary meaning and reason for the message by the author to, the, to his listeners. Or audience. First of all, we must determine the word expository. It is from the Latin word exposio or expositio, which means to a certain forth, narration or display. Thus, it means here in homiletics, the word of God has come to mean the setting forth or, ex or explanation of the message of this particular passage or biblical text. Secondly, in expository sermon, the sermon is designed to communicate what the text says, including its meaning for the historical audience way back then, and has the same meaning to the current or contemporary audience, your congregation, or you you are preaching to today. So the message remains the same. Method of preaching might change, but the message remains the same. That is the beauty of expository sermon. These are the advantages of expository sermons that gives its quality above other types of sermons. First, it discovers and exposes, discovers and exposes the writers of that book in the Bible original intention to his audience back then with its theological meaning. So once a preacher discovers the writer's meaning of a text, it is usually concerned with the standard doctrine in the Bible and theology. Well, theology is taken from the word theo, which is a Greek word meaning God, and logi comes from the Greek word logos, the word. So it is the study of God's word. It may mean also to study the nature of God and doctrines which form the theology of the Bible. Also, many Christian churches base their religious beliefs and theory, and when they develop a systematic set of beliefs, claim it as systematic theologies of the Bible, when it is really a systematic theology of that particular church. 
So it is his discovery of the real meaning of the writer's meaning, thus he preached its expositism. But most of the times, most preachers fail, for they spiritualize its meaning to the current audience, which is really wrong. Secondly, expository sermons thus is the preaching of letting the text speak again through his sermon with the same theological intention of the original author or writer. The preacher will declare after stating that God had intentionally given the message to those audience way back then. Now he intends to preach it again to the current or contemporary audience of today. Therefore, that universal and timeless message that was preached by the original writer to that historical audience, now God wants that current preacher to declare it to the contemporary audience. The preacher interprets that same biblical truth from the text to his current or contemporary audiences or listeners on that Sabbath or Sunday morning. Third advantage or quality of expository sermon over other sermons. The preacher of this particular method of preaching, once he has discovered the meaning of the text through a careful, exegetical analysis of the text in all its entirety and particulars, so he comes to the text with an analytical mind, or like a criminal scene investigator in Miami, CSI, or other related CSI TV series, and studies every clue available from its meaning for its meaning and cause. Every text, whatever little words there is, conjunction and any participles, he studies it carefully. The clues in the text are the words of the author or the text writer of the book in the Bible under study by the preacher. First, we know what he intended to say by what he wrote on the text. But we must remember, like watching CSI TV series, we, the casual viewers, overlook details but the CSI investigator carefully looks at every minute details for what it indicates about the scene. And in this case of ours, the preacher looks carefully at every detail for what these clues indicate about the author or the writer's message or intention. Once, fourth advantage or beauty of this type of sermon. Once the preacher considers every clue available to him, then the call for him to carefully consider all the contexts in which the text was originally written. So first he looks into the literary context of the language used by the writer or author. He looks into the chapters and the verses that came before and after this particular text in study. He will compare with other writers of other books of the Bible as to what they mean by the same text or doctrine or theological meaning of that word, phrase, that's its meaning in the entire Holy Scriptures or canon, is taken into consideration. Thirdly, he goes beyond the historical context of the original writing, including what was the local culture of the intended audience, its politics, its economics, and other related factors and conditions prevalent way back then that impacted this audience. Last and fourthly, this discovery of original settings of a text shapes the message and takes part in it. Or why the message was given so, the message and meaning of the writer takes part in these original settings mentioned above. Fifth, once the preacher has discovered the fourth point above, the preacher will carefully consider the structure and the genre of the selected passage. Genre, by the way, it is a simple style of or type of literature called communication. In Hebrew literary devices, uh, there are different ways of um, interpreting a message, like in, in a prose, in a poem, in, in a figurative speech, in, in, uh, in, in proverbs. It is way different on how you interpret the text, like in prophetic books. Daniel and Revelation. So you must understand the genre of the book. So here the Bible author or the writer's treatment of its subjects sets the pattern for the preacher to structure his sermon with and makes it easier for the preacher to know and discover 
what's the structure and genre, genre of the selected message. So the interpret interpretation is not far off from the intent of the author. The preacher should always tell the story when preaching a narrative. When the, when the genre is narrative, so you must be preaching in narrative, telling a story. You cannot preach in a narrative, telling a story when it's a prophetic book or it's a poem. It, uh, you don't do justice to the text. Though he will do more. As I said, the preacher should always tell the story when preaching a narrative text, which is a genre of a text, though he will do more. The purpose of exaltative text and teaching text should be reflected in the purpose of the sermon. So whatever genre it is, you must employ exaltative text, exhorting the, your audience. And teaching text should be reflected in the purpose of the sermon. Sixth advantage of expository, which gives its quality far above the other types of sermon. Once he has determined the structure of his sermon as above in point five, he then will seek to influence his audience through his use of rhetorical elements common to persuasion. Since a sermon is a persuasive speech, so he must do so. The preacher's aim is to persuade his audience with the truth of his message and ask them what they should do about it now. You must do that as a preacher. The preacher now is always persuaded by explaining, illustrating, arguing, and applying. And by these elements, they provide a balance for supporting material for sermon ideas and allow the preachers to expose the text meaning for his contemporary audience. Seventh quality or advantages of expository sermon. Once he does the above and has clinically followed the steps and advantages of the steps of point one, two, three, four, and five, then the preacher's aim for a response of faith and obedience to his partic to this particular biblical truth which he has presented on the part of his contemporary audience is guaranteed. For the audience has been convinced that the approach the preacher made is valid, genuine, and thus really biblical message will respond to any plea or appeal by the preacher. So just like the text writers expected his audience to believe and obey, so will the preacher, you, have confidence for you have discovered and presented the text writers meaning as well. Thus a positive response is guaranteed to your sermon as well. Therefore, every preacher's role, sole purpose and aim of sermon is achieved when his call for faith response from the hearer is presented correctly, theologically, and biblically, and only expository sermon and word study does that for you. The eighth and most important uh, quality of expository sermon. That is the reason expository sermon main advantage is that it was God-centered to point the listener and audience to the trustworthy subject of his faith by responding lovingly and willingly to the message that you have just exposed in your sermon. Let me now briefly go on other types of sermon. Word study sermons, just like expository sermons. I love this. Then you have topical sermons and textual sermons and biblical doctrinal sermons. Topical and textual sermons are not so good because you are trying to prove text method. You've got an idea and a concept, a concept or a doctrine or philosophical idea and then you try to justify it. That does injustice to the text. You are reading into the text your preconceived idea and very biased idea. You are not reading the text as it is what the text is trying to tell you, but you are reading into the text your preconceived ideas. Then there's autobiography, biographical sermons, which I do like to. Then you have biblical doctrine sermons and doctrinal sermons, and then philosophical sermons. Once we have covered and summarized these approaches or different types of sermons, then we will discover that there is always the best and perfect sermon presentation. I will cut the chase 
and state here that all Bible presenters should learn to preach expository sermons, then word study sermon, then autobiography sermons, and lastly, biblical doct doctrinal sermons. Therefore, the list is this, expository sermons, word study sermons, autobiography sermons, biblical doctrinal sermons are the best types of sermons. However, I would implore and stick with these three types of sermons. Expository sermons, word study sermons, autobiographical sermons, but the first two must be followed and aimed by a preacher. These are the only two methods I would propose and promote as the only sermons to use and preach and present the Bible message to God's saint. Let me give you some insights into the beauty of expository sermons and word study sermons. On word study sermons, I have the followings. In John chapter 3, verse 16, a popular text, I have 20 sermons out of it. Uh, 24 sermons are out of it. Just imagine. John 3, 16, I have 24 sermons out of it. My homiletics lecturer, Professor Alan Aaron Lopper had 13 sermons of it and gave me a challenge that is also one of the many reasons I did advance Greek language and cultural studies and Hebrew language and cultural studies as well. I offer you the challenge now today to do so. And from this text, try to create more than 20 sermons with complete topics of three to four, then it would be considered a complete sermon. But don't worry, as we go along these lectures, on homiletics, on how to prepare the sermon, I will give you the titles of these 24 sermons. Meet it out of the text. John 3, 64. Uh, John 3, 16. It is a pity that he is resting in Jesus, but I will let him know on the resurrection morning that I have met the challenge and double the amount of sermon that I have dug out on expository sermons on John 3 16. In John 3 17 I have six sermons on it but I'm still exploring for more possible sermons out of this individual text or word study. In John 3 19 I have six sermons as well but I'm still exploring more possible sermons out of this individual text and so on. For John 3 20 I have six sermons. In John 3 21 I have six sermons. In John 3 20 I have Six, six sermons and John 3 21 I have three sermons in Matthew 1 18 I have about three sermons on it but I'm still exploring for more possible sermons out of this individual text in Matthew 1 19 I have also three sermons in Matthew 1 20 I have three sermons also on it and still exploring for more possible sermons out of this individual text in Matthew 1 21 I have also two sermons in Matthew 1, 22, I have two sermons. In Matthew 1, 23, I have 24 to 26 sermons. 24 to 26 sermons. On it. Still exploring it. There are many or more other books, especially in the Old Testament, but we will leave that to a later time as we progress in this in this homiletics there are many more books as i said then i have expository sermon on bible passages paragraphs and even whole chapters of a book like the following romans 5 1 to 21 i have 30 sermons 37 sermons on it but i'm still exploring for more possible sermons out of this individual uh, bible passage luke 5 1 to 39 i have 20 sermons on it Luke 6, 1 to 49, I have 34 sermons. Luke 14, 1 to 32, I have 20 sermons. In Genesis 1, 1 to 31, I have 52 sermons on it. I've covered some of it in lecture, in lecture, in lecture 4, on Genesis chapter 1 to 3. In Genesis 2, 1 to 25, I have 39 sermons in it. In Genesis 3, 1 to 24, I have 45 sermons in it. 
And in Deuteronomy 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to 46, I have 45 sermons on it, and so forth, until the book ends. In Judges 1, 1 to 36, I have 17 sermons on it. And then Joshua chapter 8, 1 to 35, I have 11 sermons on it. This goes on for the rest of the books of, Ch uh, of, of Joshua and all other books. In 1 Samuel 15, 1 to 35, I have 14 sermons on it, but I'm still exploring for more possible of more than 14 sermons, more out of this individual text. This goes for the rest of the chapters of Samuel, book, book 1 and book 2. This is true to all the books of OT, in which I have sermons of the chapters, then more sermons by double or triple on the rest of the chapters of a particular book. Therefore, our journey together in these lectures of mine on how to prepare a sermon will be the most satisfactory experience for a preacher and Bible worker. Matthew 1, 23. In these homiletic studies, I will give you topics or themes from this particular text of Emmanuel, for I have constructed 24 sermons, themes on it. I will give you 24 themes of sermons, which I have developed into sermons, but I will only give two sermons or themes with its three to four topic outline of each sermon developed out of these two sermons or themes. I will give below the 24 sermons or themes out of this one text as we do word study on it. As I said above, that I will only provide you with two sermons with its topic outlines for these two sermons. I will give you later as the rest of the 22 sermons or themes with its complete outline topics as we go along. But that is my gift to you if you keep following my lectures on homiletics. The first sermon is titled, its theme, Jesus as the Tabernacle. This is the first theme below other topics. Jesus as the antitype of the tabernacle of earth. Jesus or Jesus, the final tabernacle in, in the new earth and the new heaven. And the third, second point, Jesus, our tabernacle in heaven for the millennium judgment. Second sermon out of this text, Matthew 1, 23. Jesus is, with, is God with us. This is the second theme below other topics of the sermon. Jesus with, with Israel over the tabernacle in Moses' sanctuary. Jesus in the holy place as the altar of incense of prayers in Moses sanctuary. Jesus is a kind of glory in the Holy of Holies of Moses sanctuary. C or third sermon, Jesus is a sanctuary in eternity. Fourth sermon, Jesus as the blood of the sacrifice in the tabernacle. Jesus is the lamb of God in the tabernacle. Jesus as the burnt offering of the tabernacle. Seventh, Jesus is our substitute in the second death in hellfire in the tabernacle sanctuary services. Eight, Jesus is the shoe bread in the tabernacle. Nine, Jesus as the menorah or seven candlestick of the Moses tabernacle. Ten, Jesus as the menorah or ten, ten candlesticks of Solomon temple or tabernacle. You see, Moses tabernacle, there was a seven candlestick. And Solomon's um, uh, temple, it, it had ten, ten candlesticks. I will deal with that as we go along. Then, the eleven topic. Jesus as the altar of incense in the tabernacle. Jesus as the veil of the tabernacle. Jesus as the ark of the tabernacle. Jesus as the Shekinah glory of the tabernacle. Jesus as the mercy seat of the tabernacle. Jesus as the priest of the daily service of the tabernacle. Jesus as the high priest of the yearly service, day of atonement of the tabernacle. Jesus is our justification. Jesus is our sanctification. Jesus is with, is with us in fire. Jesus is with us in water. Jesus is our glorification. Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus transfers our sins forever to Satan. So you see, it has 24 sermons all together. I have 26 sermons out of this one text. In John chapter 3, verse 16, I will give you five sermons with these outline topics, but you try to construct 21 other sermons or themes from John 3, 16 in which I will provide the themes to make it easier for you to come up with other word study or themes I have missed. I use you, I issue you a challenge to try and beat me on the 26 sermons. I have discovered, I have discovered that comes out of this word study approach on this text. My professor in our homiletics, Dr. Aaron Lopper, a PNG native from Manus, who got his Demon or doctor in ministry in Andrews University in 1996 had 13 sermons out of it. 
So he died before I could tell him that I discovered 26 sermons. I'm still persistently pursuing to go past 26 sermons on this one text. The 26 sermons are as following. God is love. That is the first sermon. That's the theme of the sermon. And the topics are love God with all you have. Love like God who sacrificed all heaven. Love like God who gave the best. Love like God who we hold nothing from human. The second sermon, God demands intimate love or lust over him like a lover. For he intimately loves us first. This is the type, uh, eros type of love. The first topic on this sermon is, I, on this theme, I lo love him like there is no other lover of your life. Love him affectionately like you have never loved affectionately any other person. Love him publicly with your eyes only fixed on him and no other. The third sermon that I have constructed out of John 3.16, God loves us with agape love. You must remember, Dr. Lopper never gave me a title as he issued the challenges. So if I can get it, I am sure that you can get better than me. So the third sermon on John 3.16, God loves us with agape love. Love, that is the third theme, or the third sermon. The first topic, love him by welcoming him daily in our lives. Love him by entertaining daily in our lives as the only best friend. Love him by being fond of him over others, family, loved ones. Love him dearly. The fourth sermon or theme, God loves us with social love. The first topic on this fourth sermon or theme, God demands our time to socialize with him. God demands our mind to socialize with him. God is a jealous God. If we have another secret lover, for it is to him alone to mingle with all the time. So the fifth sermon, I provided also, or the theme, the sermon outline, or the topics that to be covered in this fifth sermon. You to be pleased only with his love. You to be content with his love, only him and no other. You to be fond of him and no other. Now the sixth sermon, God's love exhibits publicly. Seventh sermon. God's love is a moral one. God's love is a brotherly love, filial love. God's love is always approval and not dismissive. God's love is always faithful in liking us. God's love is always sanctioned love, both to impose approval if accepted and but penalty if disobeyed. God's love befriends the marginalized and incarcerated. God's love is always fond of us, and He expects us to be fond of Him always. God's love kisses us daily. God's love is universal. God's love is both conditional and unconditional. God is love. God's love offers only the best, so we are to do as well. 19. God's loves us for Jesus love us to come down and die for us. 20. God's love depends on our response to this gift which cost him so dearly. 21. God's love will be will be rejected by some. 22. God's love will evoke a love response by some. God's love will be rejected by some. God's love will evoke a love response by some. And God's love is a gift in Jesus to us forever. God's love with a gamble. God's love cost Jesus his omnipresence and God the last one 26 sermon or theme God paid dearly for his love to us I will now conclude lecture one on homiletics and see you in the next lecture